Uh, the next notebook we're going to work with is going to be about classification. Uh, just a quick cliche example of where classification may show up. Uh, imagine having a data set of uh, dogs and cats, and this data set has some sort of measurement on these pets, uh, like weight, um, height, with some, some sort of measurements like that. And uh, you build a classifier where you are given those measurements and you want to be able to predict, uh, oh, was this a cat or was this a dog, something like that. And so this is really where classification shows up. In this data set, we're actually going to work on a data, sorry, in this notebook, we're actually going to work on a data set that's pretty popular, actually, in data science, the IRIS data set. Uh, it has um, 150 rows of um, uh, basically measurements on flowers. Um, so here we're going to have three kinds of uh, flowers. So if we actually, um, let me see here, if we actually get the last column of this data and get the unique elements of it. Uh, so I think it's already loaded. So let me just do unique like this. Yeah, so there's going to be three kinds of uh, flowers that we're going to work with. And each kind of flower will have like an instance of it and there's going to be measurements on that flower specifically. Uh, so that's the type of data we're going to work with. Um, just to set the stage for the rest of the notebook, there's going to be a few things we need in this notebook, aside from actually running the classification methods. Um, one thing is we, at the end, we're going to come up with like a scoreboard of all the classification methods we're uh, going to work with. Uh, so one quick way to measure those um, one quick way to measure those uh, methods we're going to see is uh, just by measuring how many uh, true positives we got. Uh, you could do other kinds of measurements, like you want to also, there's precision, there's recall, there's other kinds of things you can try and see uh, based on uh, what the predictions you get. But for here, we're just going to try and keep it simple to focus on the classification aspect and just look at the accuracy in terms of how many um, values did we get correctly or how many predictions did we get correctly. And we will also normalize to get a number between zero and one uh, just to make it, uh, put it in reference basically. Uh, so um, we're just gonna normalize by the number of uh, all the predictions we're making. All right, so, so we've already, so let me actually load the packages we're gonna use. And then this is the iris data set. We've already loaded it. And uh, here, what I will do is I will actually get the first four columns of this data frame and use it as um, a matrix. So I'm just going to convert it, convert it to a matrix because um, we will use this in this case. We need it as a matrix to pass it for the classification methods. So we actually do need the numbers. So like here, if I uh, find what X is, it's just going to be a matrix of all these numbers. Uh, and then the labels are going to be the fifth column out of that data frame. All right, the one more thing we're going to do before we get to the classification part is just kind of make a mapping between um, the actual like string label to a numeric label. Uh, so here, um, some, some classifi classifiers actually require that the input is going to be um, um, a numeric uh, label. And the way we're doing it is actually exactly similar to how, or exactly the same as we did it for the cars data set a couple of notebooks ago, where we mapped um, the origin of the car, whether it was USA, Japan, and Europe, I think, to a number between whether it was one, two, or three. Same thing here, all the numbers are going to be one, two, or three. One final thing before we actually move, actually one before final thing, before we move to the part where we actually do the classification, uh, we're going to split the data into training and testing or validation. Uh, the reason we want to do this is we want to have, we want to build, I mean, to build a classifier, you do need some data with their ground truth information. That's how you want to build the classifier. But then to evaluate the classifier, you want to pass it something you it has never seen before uh, to see if it was able to detect it correctly. Um, so the way we're going to do this is we're going to have, uh, for each type of a flower, we're going to put uh, the majority of the data from that type of flower in the training set, and then some of them in the testing, and so on for the second type of flower, and same thing for the uh, third type of flower. 
So here, um, this is the function I wrote for um, just plotting the data based on uh, still keeping like a fair distribution of all kinds of flowers in training and fair distribution of all kinds of flower in testing. Uh, so here I'm passing a 0.7 percentage, which means like about 70% of data is going to be in training and about 30% of the data is going to be in uh, testing. So if I run this, we're going to get about almost, yeah, 50 were in testing and um, 50, uh, 100 were in training. I mean, if we run this again, like it could be different numbers. It doesn't specifically have to be exactly, but it's like on average. Um, yeah, so interesting. The first time we got it was like 50 exactly, and then all the other times it was less than 50. Uh, so yeah, the reason this is happening is because we are using actually like a random sampling uh, based on uh, just, a, just, um, just a, a percentage. Um, sorry, a random sampling based on a percentage, yes, but the random sampling doesn't specifically have to give me uh, an exact uh, specific number every time. Uh, so if you actually look up at the documentation of uh, this function here is what's causing this, um, you're going to find out, yeah. So return a vector consisting of random sequence uh, given an array A, uh, where each element A is included in order to independent, independent property P. So P is the property that it's going to be included. So on average, there's going to be uh, P percent um, amount of information in that uh, um, vector, but um, we're not guaranteed a specific exact number. So that's why this varies. All right, so now we have training and testing data. Testing data has 52 elements, and the training data supposedly will have 98 um, elements. One last thing before we get to the classification part uh, is mapping those uh, predicted values. So what we will see later is sometimes instead of getting a predicted value that is like exactly one, we will get a predicted value that is say like 0 0.99. And when we see 0 0.99, we want to say that this is predicted value or predicted class one. And when we say, or when we see something like three point, uh, sorry, two point uh, one, we want to predict and say, this is a value that is uh, probably two. Uh, so this is just like a quick function to map uh, these um, predicted values. We will get to classes one, two, and three. We're just going to get uh, the number one, two, or three that is closest to that uh, value we're looking for. So we're going to get the subtraction and get the absolute value. And whichever was closest is going to be picked. All right. So the first getting to the classification part, and that's the more exciting part. Uh, so the first method we're going to work with is going to be lasso. And um, really what I want to say here is lasso, ridge, and elastic net kind of go kind of a lot of times we see them in the same context. And actually in Julia, there's this package GLM net that has all of them. And when I say all of them, it really has like one generic form of them and all you want to do is just ch change this alpha factor uh, to go from lasso to uh, ridge to elastic net. All right, so going back to lasso here. So, okay, so one, one thing you want to know about lasso, so lasso again, so there's lasso and bridge and what lasso does is that it's um, minimizing like a square, like a difference between uh, predicted and uh, what I want to predict. And um, so like ground truth and predicted, you want to think of it that way. And also minimizing um, the one norm of this vector that I'm coming up with. Like this vector I'm coming up with is going to be like a combination of uh, which features or which flowers I'm interested in. I know this might be going a little over your head for now. So like I'm not going to, I'm going to try and stop with the jargon, but I'm just going to say the main difference between lasso and ridge is that one of them is optimizing for a one norm and ridge is optimizing for uh, a two norm, basically. Um, so, yeah. Uh, okay, so going back to lasso, if I want to run um, the GLM net on the training data with the training uh, labels, um, I'm actually going to get, so if I run this here, um, oops, you will see that I will get several different values of uh, the least square. Um, sorry, yeah, uh, several different values of this lambda, which is usually a weighting parameter for um, 
the norm factor of what we're trying to find. Uh, so what you will find out here is that for very different values of lambda, we're actually getting a different uh, kind of um, accuracy, if you want to think about it this way. And so one quick way to figure out like a good lambda to use is to actually run uh, this um, cross-validation function you have from GLMNet as well, which will tell you what is the best lambda to use. And now, since we already know, or now we have like a best lambda to use, we will, in the, our case, uh, run with the best lambda. So the lambda I'm creating here is a way to access it, is to get the path.lambda of uh, the argmin of the mean loss. So we're just going to get the one with the minimum mean loss, uh, and that's going to be the argmin index. And then finally, what we actually, the way we're calling this on the training data is we're going to specify the training data itself, uh, the actual labels of the training data, and then we're going to actually explicitly say what lambda is. So we're getting the best lambda to run here. And so here we already have the path. And to predict these values, we're going to call, like, this is the testing data. So we have, uh, as we saw here, there's going to be 52 of them. And then we're going to make predictions on them. So path is what we have here, and Q is the testing data. So running it, we're going to have 52 numbers. And now is where we're going to use the function we're actually, we already created earlier, which is assign class. And this will assign classes to the lasso function. And then finally, we're going to call the find accuracy, accuracy function that we created on the very top of this notebook. Uh, so here, let's see what, yeah. So uh, finding the accuracy is going to turn out to be about 96% here. So 96% of the um, numbers we were expected to predict here were actually correct. Great. So moving on here to the ridge um, um, classification method. Uh, as I said earlier, the only difference between running lasso and ridge is really setting, changing this alpha value. Uh, so exactly, almost exactly the same pattern as before, except that here we're setting alpha to be equal to zero. Um, here we didn't set an alpha just because alpha is actually default, it defaults to be one in this case in the GLMnet um, function. So we're just going to run, essentially these are exactly the same syntax, except that we added alpha is equal to zero. Um, and the accuracy increased. So good job for Rich so far. It's the winner. Uh, next, we're going to move on to Elastic Knot. So Elastic Knot is really just a combination of both um, uh, Lasso and Ridge. Um, but it uh, has like a weighting factor of half, or you can decide on a weighting factor of half for Lasso and a weighting factor of half for Ridge. So you're optimizing for both uh, norms. So again, essentially the same exact code, except that you decide on alpha to be 0 0.5 here. And let's see what this is going to look like. Again, so this is, so far, Ridge and Elastic Knot are doing best. Okay, so moving on, now we're going to move to actually a different package, and this one's going to be the decision tree package. And the way we're going to use a decision tree is pr pretty s straightforward. Uh, there's really this uh, function that you want to use as a um, kind of uh, constructor to build your tree. And the way you would do it is, uh, so yeah, you will build the decision tree classifier, and then you will use the fit function on that model. And then uh, you will use the training data and then the training labels to actually build the tree. So, so far we haven't done any classification yet. So far we're just, we created like kind of a placeholder for this tree. And then um, now we're figuring out the tree based on uh, the data that we already have. Um, and next we have, we set the query uh, from the testing data and we get decision tree dot predict of the model. Now we've already created a model. And we have the queue, which is the values we're looking for. And finally, we'll find the accuracy of a prediction's decision tree with the Y test data. And let's find out what this is going to, oh, this, we didn't run this. OK. 92 so far. All right. So lasso comes, not last so far. So decision trees are a little worse. All right. so. Moving on, uh, let's do random forest. Actually, the syntax is also very similar. It's also uh, using the decision tree package. Uh, so instead of using a 
decision tree classifier, just use a random forest classifier. Uh, and yeah, so syntax super similar. Um, again, the queries here, we're passing test IDs and making the prediction based on a model. All right, so moving on to the sixth method in this notebook. Uh, so here we're going to use a KD3 or uh, the nearest neighbor method. Um, and nearest neighbor is kind of like, it's not like you want to call a classifier right away uh, on it. You just want to do a little bit of pre-processing for us here. Uh, so the way we're going to do it is build a KD tree on the data itself. Uh, and then um, once you've built the KD tree, you basically have a distance. Like it's really easy to know uh, if given a new query, what is the closest point um, uh, from like some distance perspective uh, to this point you're looking for. Uh, so here, um, X train and X, uh, sorry, Y train, uh, we don't we don't actually use Y train just yet. Uh, all we need is the X train data to build a KD tree on this data, basically connect, like be able to quickly find what are the nearest neighbor to a given uh, data point once we are looking for it. And then the queries here are just, we're gonna call them to be from the testing data. And so this is where things get interesting. So far, we're not actually using uh, the Y uh, labels, right? All we used is the X data. And so here, when we're having the queries, we're calling the queries, sure, transpose, that's the format it requests, and we're passing a KD tree. What this is gonna do is for each query, uh, we're passing here five. You could choose to have a K that is different. For each query, uh, it's going to pick the five elements that are closest to it. And once it picks the five elements that are close to it, we're actually going to do a little bit of uh, post-processing here. Ooh, what am I doing? So, yeah. So after I've finished um, getting the queries, like top five closest to each query point, I'm going to do a little bit of Pre -pro post processing here. And by post processing, I mean I'm just trying to get out of these five, I'm going to get a counter of uh, what was most present based on uh, the Y. Um, let's see. Yeah, so the Y. Um, all right, so this is the actual. Okay, so here, here we go. So we've got, uh, so the ID X's are all the. Um, First five are the first top closest five to the first query. Second five are closest to the next query and so on and so forth. So I'm getting them and just concatenating them in all like in one vector here. And then for each element essentially, or for each query, what I'm looking for is to find uh, how many, like if um, I had five closest numbers and um, the actual labels for them were three, 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 to three, well, I want to pick the label to be three. That's how this is going to work. So this is how I'm doing it here with a map on all of them. And let's see what happens here. So yeah, the accuracy is actually 96 here. So that's pretty cool. Finally, the last method we'll cover here is the SVM. And, and then I don't think I have, let me do Y train is equal to uh, Y of train IDs. All right. Great. Okay, so so far we haven't used them in this format, but I think this is the first time we use them here in this format. Uh, for SVM, we're just going to train the data right away. Pretty easy syntax, uh, except that, again, the columns should be each observation. And finally, the prediction is pretty straightforward as well. Uh, all I have to do is call SVM on uh, X tests um, and then pass the model and find the accuracy. And the accuracy is about 96%. Right, so finally, I'm just going to put everything together and find out what the accuracy is going to look like. So, yeah, Ridge is probably, yeah, Ridge is still the best method here. So that's pretty cool. Okay, so we did get interrupted a little bit here just because I figured there was something wrong with the numbers. And that is, I remember that Elastic Nut had a different number. So I went back to try and track down what was going on with this uh, number, and I figured that there was a mistake in running the original um, accuracy function. And that is, let's see, it was here. So this was not the 
correct values, like if I actually do control C here, command Z, it was predictions underscore ridge. And that was that was the the, the wrong vector to compare to. Uh, that's why it was 98. So the, the number below is actually the correct number, uh, but here it should have been elastic net. And that's uh, the correct number. So it's very, it's the same number as um, here. Perfect. Okay, so now that's taken care of. And with that, we will end this uh, notebook. Hopefully, uh, you can check off all of these boxes as well. You hopefully will be able to run all these classifiers on your data. And yeah, the cool finding is really just a comparison, a scoreboard of everything. Um, Elastic net, uh, sorry, Ridge seems to be the winner here. So that's pretty cool. And I will see you next time at the next notebook.